We are Life Church Livonia. My name is Alex. I'm on staff here at Life Church Livonia. If this is your first time, I just want to say welcome. We're really glad you're here. We believe God has brought you here this morning on purpose for a purpose. Right now we're in the middle of a series called Love Where You Live. We have this dope t-shirt swag. You can buy it out in the lobby. What, what? And uh, this series is, is really important to us. Uh, Brian, our lead pastor, and I have really been looking forward to this series for a long time uh, because this is the heartbeat of our church, about loving where you live. Um, over this past week, between this last Sunday and today, our church turned five years old. Live Church Livonia is officially five years old. And for those of you party people that are wondering where the cake is, oh, it's coming, okay? Not today. But we're having a cider and donut party on October 27th. And I, you got to wait, but patience is a virtue. Okay, so we will celebrate our birthday, just not today. But Brian and I partnered together to plant this church uh, to try to love where we live. Life Church Livonia exists for the express purpose of creating a place where people who are far from God can find life in Jesus Christ. That is why we exist. Our name comes from the verse John 10.10, 10, which says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that you may have life and have it to the full. We're called Life Church because we believe Jesus is the only way to life and life to the full. No other philosophy, no other religion, no other prophet or path can bring that kind of abundant life that Jesus has to offer. We're not going to read it today, but earlier in this passage, Jesus talks about how there are thieves that would come to steal, to kill, and destroy. And really the point of a thief, if you think about it in terms of his metaphor, is that there's this pen of sheep that belonged to Jesus, and these thieves are coming in to try to steal the sheep. And what's the point of stealing the sheep? It's so that the sheep now follow that thief as the shepherd. And there are lots of thieves that we follow as shepherds, and we see this in Livonia all the time. People follow security, they follow comfort, they follow sex, they follow money, they follow power, they follow independence, they follow success, as the shepherd that is directing and guiding their life. And we know from experience that these shepherds only lead us to destruction. They kill, they steal, they destroy our joy, they destroy our relationships, our peace, and uh, they can't lead us to life and life everlasting. But Jesus can. And we believe he's the only shepherd who can give us life and life to the full. Because we believe as Christians that he has come down from heaven to redeem the brokenness of the world and to make all things new, to make all things right. We believe he saved us from sin by dying on the cross. And that by raising up from the dead, he has invited us into life and eternity with God forever. Only 17% of Livonia attends church. And we know that not everyone that attends church has a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, which means less than one in five people in our city of 95,000 is going to spend eternity with God. I want you to imagine the five people that matter most to you, maybe family, maybe friends, maybe aunts and uncles. I, I, don't, know, I don't know who that is, but the five people that matter most to you and choose one of them to go to heaven and be with God and four to go to hell. That is unacceptable to us, and that is unacceptable to God. And that is why Life Church Livonia exists. All the decisions we make, all the money we spend, all the roles that we have, all the hours we put in exist for that purpose. And if you don't know Jesus here this morning, I want you to know he is inviting you into life and life to the full. So as we jump into the word that God has for us this morning, um, I want to pray for our lead pastor, Brian. He's not here today. He's in Alaska coaching another church plant. He's living sent, and he's doing that on behalf of our church and for our denomination. And uh, he's going to have to come back, and it's going to be, you know, a bumpy ride. Alaska is in a very different time zone, very different climate, and um, he's going to have to jump back in. So I just want to pray for him and for that transition, and just pray for us that God would speak to us this morning and we'd hear him. So, Lord, we just come before you today. We need you. We pray for Brian, God. I just ask that you'd give him wisdom, that you'd give him insight, that you'd give him clarity of thought and mind. Speak to him through your spirit. Speak through him by your spirit, Lord, and give him um, just help as he tries to discern how to follow you in, in coaching this other church plant. And, Lord, we just ask for us today. We know we need you desperately. 
Father, we know that you are uh, our life, that you have the words of eternal life, Lord, and, and we want to hear them today. I pray that you'd remove the things in our heart that are keeping us from you, that are keeping us from seeing you and hearing you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen. So my wife and I have run a couple of half marathons, and it's not something I wanted to do, <laughs> but I was uh, leading worship one day at Life Canton is just like a guest worship leader. Life Church Canton is one of our sister churches in our network, and uh, that day they happened to have the Team World Vision informational meeting for people that were interested in running half marathons and marathons, and I thought to myself, that is not me. And so I uh, led worship, and I'm packing up, and I'm talking to my friends, and, you know, talking to people who are there. And then it comes time to leave, and I have all my gear on my back, as you've seen me here, you know, like a pack mule, and I just cannot find Amber. And so I go into the lobby, and Amber's not there, and I'm looking around and, you know, trying to find her, and I think, ah, she's probably hanging out with our friend Sam and Marissa in the sound booth. So I go up to the sound booth, and she's not there, and I'm like, Sam, have you seen Amber? And he's like, no, I haven't seen her. And so I head back down, and I just can't find her. And then I walk into the lobby, or the auditorium, I mean, and I see the Team World Vision informational meeting, and Amber's sitting there with a pen and a piece of paper taking notes. <laughs> and I think, oh, no. <laughs> she is not in that meeting because she wants to run the half marathon. She's in that meeting because she wants us to run that half marathon. <laughs> And so on the way home, of course, she's trying to convince me, please, we got to do this. It's going to be so great. Think about the babies in the water. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. That We can give them money. We don't have to run 13 miles, you know. And you know, I have a workout routine I really like. We don't ha I don't want to do this. And then she goes into this whole thing about, listen, my parents let me quit so many things when I was a kid. I never had to finish something. And I don't want our kids to be quitters. And I can't be a quitter. And I want to do something really hard, and I want to overcome it for the sake of our children. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty compelling. That's noble. And so we started training for this marathon, this half marathon. And we started at the bottom. And Team World Vision, if you've run with them before, has this great um, training plan. And so we were just following that. And you know, we run like three to four days a week. And um, it was going pretty good. It was hard, but it wasn't impossible. You know, it wasn't uh, the end of the world. And so, um, you know, we're running, we're up and in mileage, but then the week of our first anniversary rolls around, and we go on vacation to northern Michigan. And that week, our long run was a five-mile run. And neither of us had ever run that far before. So we're really nervous, we're really freaked out, but we get our gear on, and we go, okay, well, I guess we just got to start running. And we, so we start going for the run, and it was awful. It was just one of the worst runs of my life. It was like 90 degrees outside, and, um, you know, it was in July, and it was 90 degrees outside. We were running, you know, in a place with no sidewalks on the sides of these dirt roads, and cars are zipping past us way too fast, and we're getting rocks in our shoes. And about halfway through the run, Amber's just like, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> this is too hard. And so we have the conversation again about, but this is what you wanted. You wanted to make it past this point. We can't quit now. And so we started using the phrase with each other, this is when it counts. You want to quit. This is when it counts. We have to keep running. This is when it counts. And so we finished that race, just, or finished that run, I'm sorry, never wanting to run again. We just were exhausted and tired. It was a stress on our marriage. It was a stress on our bodies. It was a stress on <laughs> and, and we just never wanted to run again after that. So about a week later, we're on vacation with my family, and my dad is an avid runner. You know, he's run tons of marathons, tons of half marathons. He'll go for like a 13-mile run just because he has a fever and wants to sweat it out. You know, like just as a maniac. And um, I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know? And so he wanted to go on a run with us because it's something we were both into. And I was like, oh, okay, you're more into it than we are. And um, we go on this run, and we think, this will, it'll make our long run easier or whatever. We start going on this run, and he starts noticing some things about the way we're running and, and starts making these little comments to help us out. He's like, hey, it's, I notice it's mile three, and, and you're starting to hunch a little bit because you're tired. But what's happening when you do that is you're actually just giving gravity more of a surface area to pull down with and you're not um, helping yourself at all. It's making it harder because you're destroying your momentum. So now your muscles are having to generate even more energy to propel you forward. And we're like, really? He's like, yeah, so what, what you should do is if you keep your shoulders in line with your hips and then just lean forward a little bit, gravity will generate some of the momentum for you and you don't have to work as hard. 
And I was like, that's incredible. And so we try it out. And he keeps noticing these things and giving us tips as we're running. He talks about how our, our breathing needs to change a little bit and how we need to do these things called cleansing breaths because when you're running, your body thinks, I'm going to die. Something's chasing me. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why you would run. And so you do this thing called a cleansing breath, and, that, and that's why you feel that way, right? So the cleansing breath is you breathe into your diaphragm and you hold it in until you have to breathe out. And it, what it does is it fills your diaphragm just like you do when you're sleeping, and it tells your body, no, 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 no one's chasing us, we're cool, I'm just doing this because, you know, <laughs> like, we're not going to die, it's okay. Uh, and, and then your body starts to stop treating itself like it's in fight or flight mode. So she's giving us all these tips. And that day we ran like seven miles, and it was two to three times easier than the five-mile run we had done the week before. And I thought to myself, holy cow. The way that we've been running can take us to mile five, but it cannot take us farther than that. If we are going to finish this race, we have to change the way we run because we're not in this race for five miles. We're in this race for 13.1, baby. And living scent, following Jesus, is a lot like training for a half marathon. When we start following Jesus, we have a way that we run our lives. That's how we say it, right? This is how I run my life. This is how we run things around here. And that way it seems fine at first, right? The miles start climbing up, and life doesn't seem to be falling apart. But every single one of us will inevitably hit a point in our relationship with Jesus where the way we are running cannot take us any farther where the way that we've been doing things can't keep happening. And there are these warning lights that come on on the dashboard of our souls to let us know that this is happening and it's time to change the way we're running. One of those is we've been coming to church a lot, but our coworkers wouldn't have any idea. The way we talk, the way we act, how we don't give grace and react in anger, the language we use, they would have no clue that we're coming to church. Another one of those warning lights is that we connect with God during praise and worship, and it feels so deep and powerful and true, but our kids still feel like we're angry and harsh and judgmental. Another one of those warning lights is we have a devotional life, but it's not making our marriage better. There's still tension. The old problems that were there before we were following Jesus are still there. Another one of those warning lights is we're following Jesus, but our relationships with God or with other people are burning out. When our relationship with God is constantly plagued by doubt, by disappointment, by fear, when our relationships with other people are in constant conflict or in separation or in tumult, these are warning lights on the engine of our souls like, hey, 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 the way you're running can't take you farther. You have to change the way you're running or stop following Jesus because his way is different than this way. And I just want to say two things. One, this is a really normal part of growing in Christ. If that's you this morning, I just want you to know, like, welcome to the club. Okay, this is normal. This is a normal, natural part of growing in maturity in Christ. But I also want to say, right before you, you have two options today. Option number one is keep running your way and follow a thief instead of the good shepherd. And option number two is let Jesus change the way you run this morning. And follow the good shepherd into life and life abundant. So here at Life Church Livonia, we don't want you just to live sent for a week. We don't want you to have this relationship with Jesus that lasts a month or a couple years. We want you to live sent for a lifetime. Because we are not interested in a five-mile Christianity. We're interested in the whole race. And we're interested in helping you grow and train so that you can endure that race. The word disciple and the word discipline come from the same root word. And discipline doesn't mean punishment, it means training. It means training. To be a disciple is to be someone who is trained by a master. And so as we are disciples of Christ trying to follow Jesus, what we're saying is I am letting the master Jesus train and change the way I do things so that I can follow you. I can do things your way. And so the question becomes this morning, how do we run the race so that we live sent for a lifetime and we don't burn out at mile five? Because just like a half marathon, there's going to be places you want to quit. And we want to see you follow the good shepherd to the end and find life and life to the full. 
So this morning we're going to look at this passage of scripture uh, that really illustrates this really well. There's a whole group of disciples that quit the race, and there's a group of disciples that stick with Jesus in the race. And what we want to look at this morning is what makes the quitters quit, and what makes the people that endured endure, and how do we do that? Because there's some real wisdom here for us. So just a little bit of background. Uh, We're going to be in John chapter 6. If you have your Bible with you or you have the Bible app, I invite you to pull that out. If you don't, don't worry. The scriptures will be on the screen. But we're in John chapter 6 this morning. And John chapter 6 starts out with this really famous miracle. It's called the feeding of the 5,000. Now, we call it the feeding of the 5,000 because Jesus miraculously feeds this group of 5,000. But it's more than that. The Bible says there's 5,000 men which means including women and children, we're looking at probably ten to 15,000 people. And, and so when this chapter begins, Jesus is blowing up. He, he is like trending off the charts, right? People are seeing things he, that they've never seen before with Jesus. He's raising the dead. People who are born blind are seeing. People who have lame legs are walking. He's literally changing people's biology, people's brain chemistry, and and people's uh, souls with death to life. And people have never seen anything like this before. And on top of that, he is giving them a kind of teaching about the will of God that they are 100% unfamiliar with. The Bible says that people said about Jesus, no one has ever spoken with the kind of authority that Jesus is talking about with God. This guy is incredible. And so Jesus' little ministry has grown from just a couple people to like 15,000 people. With no social media, this guy has built a mega church in like a year. It is unbelievable. But it's also uh, got some issues that we're going to see come to surface in this passage. So anyway, this group of 15,000 people, they're with Jesus. They go out into the desert and to hear Jesus preach because he's such an icon right now. And um, they, they stay all day. They don't eat. They're just listening to Jesus teach. And Jesus has compassion on them and says, oh, my gosh, you guys haven't eaten all day. If I send you home now, you're going to faint on the way home and not be able to make it back home. we got to feed these people. Talking to his disciples, we've got to feed these people. And they're like, are you crazy? How are we going to feed 15,000 people? We're 12 guys. We don't even have food with us. And what the Bible says is a little boy offered up five loaves. It's a small loaf, so think like a roll or like a hamburger bun size, and, and two fish. Jesus prays over these five loaves and two fish and feeds all 15,000 people and has 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Just incredible. The people are amazed. And so he sends them on their way, fully fed, fully satisfied with leftovers. He goes off on a mountain to pray. The disciples cross the Sea of Galilee, which is, it's like a glorified lake. Think of it, uh, it's not even quite as big as like Lake Michigan, but it, it's a big lake, more than a sea. And um, this is where Jesus was teaching these people. So they cross to the other side to continue the ministry. They get caught in a storm overnight, and Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And they're freaking out. They're not sure how to take this in. They're not sure if they can even trust their eyes. Jesus is walking on the water. He calms the storm. He gets in the boat, and they reach the other side. So this is kind of the backdrop for the passage that we're going to read today. So they get to the other side. And here at the other side, lo and behold, who should be there but the crowd from the day before? And this is where we pick up. It says, when they found him on the other side, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? (laughs) Like, oh, Jesus, you're here too? Fancy that. But what this means is that they must have walked through the night around the perimeter of the Sea of Galilee in order to meet Jesus here today. That is some major commitment. That is some serious commitment to trying to follow God. Um, But Jesus answers them, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work that God requires? So here we see this crowd is truly dedicated to following Jesus. This, this group of 15,000 people, they're no slouches. They ate one meal, and they walked miles around a sea to find Jesus on the other side. But they have mixed motives. And Jesus can see those mixed motives and calls that out. He says, listen, you're not here for me. You're here for what I can give you. You're here because I gave you food yesterday, and you're hungry again, and guess what? You're looking for me again. So... <laughs> 
why don't you stop working for food that's going to keep us in this cycle and start working for something that's going to satisfy you for a lifetime and beyond? And these people genuinely want to follow God because they respond, well, how do we do that? That's what we want. We, how do we follow? What's the work God requires? We'll do it. These people genuinely are trying to follow God, but they have these mixed motives. And they're, they're trying to follow God for what God can give them. And um, Jesus responds to them like this. Jesus answers, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Pausing real quick, this is the core of this passage, and this is the core of this message. It seems simple at first. Jesus is saying, just believe in me, and that's the food you're looking for. But we're going to see that this is where the separation begins between the people that finish the race today in this passage and the people that don't. Um, Because it's going to be hard to believe in Jesus when they're looking for Jesus just to satisfy their own needs. And we're going to see this split begin to happen. And here's where it starts. Verse 30 says, so they asked him, well, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? And here we start to see the split happen. Here we start to see the motives separate. Because Jesus literally just took seven little pieces of food and fed 15,000 people. But yesterday's miracle isn't enough for today's faith. Yesterday's miracle isn't enough for me to trust Jesus today. And this is such an easy place to get into. I don't want to overly criticize this crowd because we are this crowd. All of us are this crowd at some point. Because this crowd, every new need is a new trial. We're putting God on trial. Yep, Lord, you provided for that need. Thank you for that. Yesterday the meal was really good. But what about today? What about today? We're here again. Okay, the work of God is to believe in in him who sent. Yeah, I believed yesterday and that was great. But now today, prove it. What kind of miracle are you going to do? And not only what kind of miracle are you going to do, but they have a specific one in mind that, again, is going to start to reveal some motives here that are not good. They said, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. This is where things really start to separate. And I want to tell you why. The miracle of manna in the wilderness is one of the most famous Jewish miracles of all time. It was one of the original signs to the Jewish people that God was with them and that he was going to take care of them. Moses had led the people out of Egypt. God had miraculously freed them from slavery. They had miraculously gone through the Red Sea. And then for 40 years in the wilderness, God rained down bread from heaven so that the people could eat and not die in the wilderness. And this is where we start to see that separation between people who are going to stick with Jesus and believe him and and those who are not. Because they're saying, okay, you want us to believe in you. We want to do God's work. That's great. Why don't you do this old miracle? I know you're doing your miracles, and your miracles are great. We like them. It was really delicious yesterday. Thank you very much. But if you did this miracle, then we would know you're from God. Because we know God already did this miracle. So if you just replicate something God's already done, then we can know for sure that you're from God. And this is the the tricky thing here. Again, it seems genuine. They want to follow Jesus. They want to be sure of their faith. Those are good things. But they're following Jesus on their own terms. They're saying, yeah, Jesus, we'll believe in you, but here are the boxes you got to check. Because what's really happening is they're spiritually insecure. They're nervous to trust Jesus. They don't want to follow the good shepherd. They want to lead the good shepherd because they want to make sure he's heading in the right direction. And they have this whole list of things that he needs to check before they're willing to actually trust him. And then Jesus replies like this. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they're like, right, that's the bread we want. Always give us this bread. We just asked you for that miracle in the desert. You're saying it's from your father. Right, ask your father, then we'll believe. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread. And what Jesus is saying here is radical, offensive even. Because what he's saying is that miracle of manna in the desert was not just about God's provision for one people at one place at one time. 
It was a prophetic revelation about God's plan of provision for all people in all places for all time. And that miracle is pointing to me. I am the bread that God has sent down from heaven. I am the true manna. Every single day your ancestors had to collect new bread from this new miracle and were never satisfied. They died in the desert. But I am a bread that if you eat of me, you will never die. And the people don't know what to think about this. And and Jesus continues. I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at that last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him and said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? I just want to do a quick recap. Because the people are caught up in each new thing that Jesus is saying. But there's a bigger picture going on here. So Jesus says, you want bread from me like yesterday. But you should work for bread that will satisfy you for life. Talking about serving God. The people say, yep, you're right. That's great. We want to serve God. Tell us how to do what God wants. Jesus says, God wants you to believe in me. The people say like, maybe. Uh, We'll see. Why don't you do this and then we'll believe in you. Okay, why don't you do this over here and then we'll believe in you. Do something God's already done that we know is God and then we'll believe in you. Give us bread from heaven like Moses did in the Old Testament. And Jesus is saying, I am the bread from heaven. I am what you're asking for. I am what you're looking for. And the people are grumbling, but they've missed it. You see, they've totally missed it because this is the work. What's the work of God? To believe in the one he has sent. Jesus is giving them an opportunity in this offense to believe in him, to do the work they're asking about, to get the thing they're wanting, but they can't see it. But they can't see it at all. They've 100% missed it. Because Jesus goes on to start talking about if you want to really have the true bread from heaven, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And if, in case you don't know, the Jews have some pretty intense dietary laws, and human flesh is not kosher. If you go to the supermarket and the kosher section, you're not going to find human flesh. It's just not going to be there. And so this is pretty horribly offensive to them, and they don't understand. And I think that's the point. Because the work of God is not to understand everything that God is doing. The work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is not to understand the uh, turn-by-turn Google Maps instructions that the Good Shepherd is taking. The work of God is to follow the Good Shepherd, period. And and these people have asked for it and are now missing it, 100% missing it. The scriptures goes on to say, on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? And from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. In one sermon, the megachurch implodes, blows up. One sermon, Jesus destroyed this whole ministry. (laughs) And in in some translations, it says... (coughs) Some translations, it says the crowd was offended at Jesus. And I love that. I love that because uh, I get offended at Jesus. I think you get offended at Jesus. Offended that he's not fixing this suffering over here that's really painful and hard. Offended that he's letting the Democrats do this and the Republicans do that. Offended that he's not giving me the financial blessing I feel like I need and deserve for following him. Offended that, whatever, fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. But the question becomes, not are they offended at Jesus, but are they've asked for this, right? Think about that. They asked, we want to do the work that God requires. Jesus says, believe in me. And then he tells them something he knows they can't understand. Because we know when he's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he's talking about communion. He's talking about his death on the cross. He's not talking about cannibalism. But they don't know that yet. And he's giving them this opportunity in the face of something they don't understand and they can't understand yet to believe in him or not. And they walk away. 15,000 people walk away. The 
question then becomes, are we going to stick with Jesus when we're offended and don't understand or not? Are we going to keep believing that the good shepherd is the only shepherd that can bring life and life to the full? Are we going to do the work of God believing in the one he has sent or find a new shepherd? And Jesus asks that question to his 12 remaining disciples. He says, you don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asks the 12, and Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So we see this clear picture of some disciples that hang in uh, for, with Jesus for a lifetime and those who don't. And, and out of the 12, not even all 12 stick with him. We know Judas betrays him. So out of this group of 15,000 people, 11 guys stick with Jesus. 11 guys stick with Jesus. But from those 11 people have come every Christian on the face of the planet for the past 2,000 years, which numbers in the billions which numbers in the billions. Those 12 changed the world because they finished the race. They lived sent for a lifetime. And the difference that we see, there's a couple differences, but one of the major differences is the disciples were okay with not getting it. Jesus just walked on the water. Do you think they're like, oh, yeah, I, I know the physics of that. <laughs> like, what is happening? And then he gives this hard teaching that the disciples were there for. And they're like, listen, man, I don't know. I don't know lots of things, okay, but you raised the dead, all right? Like, I don't know, I don't know what else I need to know. And uh, the 10,000, the 15,000 that, that leave him, they, they have a lot of expectations of God that they're not willing to let go of. So I want to take a couple minutes and talk about what are the differences between the disciples that stayed and those that left and how do we follow those differences so that we can stay with Jesus, living sent for a lifetime? I think the first thing that's really important to see is um, we have to let Jesus teach us how to run the race. Because the disciples that leave have terms and conditions. And if Jesus meets those terms and conditions, they'll follow him. But every new day is an opportunity for new terms. Yesterday's miracle isn't enough for today's trust. And so they have this constant insecurity about Jesus because they're still trying to follow Jesus on their own terms. But uh, the disciples that stuck with Jesus were willing to let go of their expectations and, and be willing to let Jesus do what he was going to do and just follow him. And we do this a lot, and here's, here I want to give two examples of this. When I was a kid, uh, I was five, we moved into this new house at Bear Lake Bible Camp. It was really great. I remember really distinctly, there's this upper uh, hallway at the top of the stairs, and all the rooms came off this one hallway, and we were stripping a bunch of wallpaper and painting stuff, and we were getting into all these different rooms, all the bedrooms, and stripping the wallpaper and painting and things like that. And my grandpa was there, and he had built the house my mom grew up in, and my dad was there, and I really looked up to both of them and really wanted to help. And so, um, you know, I, I watched what they were doing and how they were stripping the wallpaper with the scraper, and I thought, okay, it's not too hard. I could do that. And so uh, I looked around and noticed they hadn't started on one of the rooms yet. And I thought, here's my opportunity. I'm going to take a scraper, and I'm going to go into this room and do like a whole wall. And they're going to come in all tired from all the other walls they've done and see this whole wall done and go, Alex, you did this? And I'm like, well, and they'll be like, that was so great. Like, oh, it was nothing, just a scraper, you know, it's just a, you know, a little scraper. And... Um, so I had this whole plan in my head. And so I, I grab a scraper, and I go into the room kind of when they're not looking because I want it to be a surprise. And, you know, I start scraping on this wall. And about five minutes later, my dad comes in, and I think, here it is. Here's my chance. And he goes, oh, no, what are you doing? <laughs> we were going to leave the wallpaper up in this room. And my heart sank. <laughs> and to the day we moved in, to the day we moved out, there was a big patch of wallpaper missing right about my eye level <laughs> in that room. <laughs> and the problem was not, I had the right heart, right? But I didn't ask my dad, how can I help? I decided how I was going to help and then hoped he blessed that, right? Right? I decided how I was going to help and then hoped he blessed that. We do this a lot. We do this a lot. I do this a lot. We, we do this in, at church. You know, maybe someone makes you frustrated, hurts your feelings, makes you mad, and you think, okay, Lord, I'm a Christian. They're my 
brother or sister in Christ. I want to love them. I want to respect them. I know what I'm going to do. When I see them at church next Sunday, even though it's painful, I'm going to say hi, give them a hug, and, and that'll mend things. And so we come in, we say, hey, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. And we go into worship and think, oh, Lord, I've been obedient. I'm so great at this. But we haven't asked God anything. We just told him, hey, there's this rift. I know how I'm going to fix it, Lord. I hope you bless that in your name. I do this in my marriage sometimes. Like, say, Amber's a saint. She's genuinely a saint. But let's pretend she made me mad, hypothetically. <laughs> and uh, hurt my feelings. And, uh, you know, I'm frustrated and I'm hurt and I feel justified in my hurt. And I think to myself, okay, I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. Jesus, I want to follow you. I know what I'm going to do. She loves it when I do the dishes. She loves it when I vacuum. I'm going to vacuum and do the dishes before she comes home so that we can talk about how she hurt me without having these things in the way. And so I vacuum and I do the dishes, and then I'm waiting for her to get home, thinking to myself, Lord, I'm just really doing great following you today. But vacuuming and doing the dishes are fine. They're good things. But I didn't ask. I didn't ask, Lord, how do I need to love my wife in your name today? Because maybe what he wanted me to do in my self-justification of my hurt was to apologize for something I did. Maybe what he wanted me to do was just to listen and not to speak and not to try to set up a conversation that I thought was going to be fruitful, right? That, that I'm, telling, I'm following Jesus, but I'm doing it on my terms. And guess what that's going to end in? Bad news. He's not going to bless that because I'm just like the disciples in this passage. I'm like, all right, Lord, I'll follow you, but first you need to heal this. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm not letting Jesus teach me how to run the race. Because I'm not asking God how to follow him. I'm telling God. And the problem isn't my behavior. Again, doing the dishes, listening, those are all good things. Hugging people at church that have hurt you, that's a good thing. But I'm telling, not asking. And if we are going to make it past mile five and are running the race with Jesus, we need to flip that script and ask, Lord, how do I follow you in this? What are you asking of me? The second thing that we need to do if we're going to live sent for a lifetime is we need to run together. We need to run together. Team World Vision is really great because Saturday is your training run. It's your, long, or your, your longest training run of the week. And they do this big get together where everyone gets together so that we can run the hardest, longest, most difficult part of the week together. And uh, it, it is so much easier. It makes it so much better um, if you're part of the Grow Ministry at Life Church Livonia, and you know who you are, I just want you to come to the stage right now real quick. And I want you to know, just like in Team World Vision, that we're not running alone. Here at Life Church Livonia, in your relationship with Jesus, you are not running alone. Over the summer, come all the way up on the stage, file in. Over the summer, Brian and Jeff Kaiser and I worked really hard um, at developing what we call the Grow Flow. I call it the growth flow, they don't. But uh, the growth flow is this idea that we have created a pathway that is a normal and natural way where you can grow in Christ at Life Church Livonia. And these men and women are a part of making that happen so that you are not running alone. Renee Boyle is in charge of our first steps. If you are a, a young believer, you don't understand the fundamentals of the Christian faith yet, maybe you don't understand what sin is. You don't understand heaven and hell. You don't understand uh, how to operate in the Holy Spirit or your spiritual gifts, what they are. Renee's your girl. We have a discipleship curriculum she has written just for you to help you get a foundation in Christ that will help you run the race for a lifetime. Dave is in charge of our prayer ministry. They pray with you. They pray for you. They pray on your behalf every single Sunday. And if you're trying to figure out, how do I hear from God? How do I listen to the Holy Spirit? How do I obey in that? Dave's your man. He is here to help you grow in that. If you're a young mom here, like Whitney, woo-woo, coming up. If you're a young mom, uh, birth through five, uh, there are specific challenges associated with that part of the race. And Mops, Jenna, and Andrea are here to help you run that well so that you're not running that part of the race alone. And then Amber and uh, Rachel are here for Scene. If you're a woman at Life Church Livonia looking to get in community and to grow deeper in your faith, Scene is for you. It is for you. Please see them in the lobby. And the same with the men here. Men, 
If you're looking for people to be around you, to be in your corner, to grow in Christ, to learn how to lead your family, to learn how to say no to your temptations, Jeff and Chris have a ministry that is designed to help you do that. You are not running alone here at Life Church Livonia. These people have signed on and said yes to helping you run the race for a lifetime because that's what we're interested in here. And I just want to take a second and pray over them. Oh, and Sarah, I'm so sorry. Small groups. Oh, wow, that would have been terrible. If you're a small group leader, um, small groups, uh, Sarah is now in charge of small groups. Our small groups before, it had been kind of, you know, uh, let's say speckled. But Sarah is bringing all that under one roof together, under one umbrella. If you're a small group leader, Sarah's here to care for you. If you're looking for a small group, Sarah's here to help you do that. She is going to do an amazing job leading our small groups ministries. We are really looking forward to her. We've prayed about these people a lot, and we believe these are the people that God has chosen for such a time as this at our church. And I just want to pray for them real quick together, bless them, commission them, and then we'll wrap up here. So, Lord Jesus, I just pray over these people. I ask that you would bless them by your Holy Spirit. God, I ask that you would help them uh, to run the race well. We know the enemy is coming for them. And, Lord, I just pray that you would help them to stand strong, that you would heal the broken places in their own lives, Lord, that you would gird them up and strengthen them by your Holy Spirit to prepare them for the work of ministry before you, Lord, and help each of us to follow you, Lord, to run this race the way that you want us to run it. In the name of Jesus, amen. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. You can take a seat. And lastly, if we're going to run this race for a lifetime, living sent for a lifetime, we have to commit to finishing the race when we start. There's no way Amber and I could have ever finished that half marathon unless we decided that we were going to finish it from the start. Because the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. The reason Peter and the other 11 disciples didn't quit is they had committed to believing in Jesus no matter what. They didn't have a plan B. They were counting on Jesus to come through. And if he was going to fall, they were going to fall with him. One of the saddest things to me about the disciples that left is it's in this context of the fishes and loaves conversation. And that fishes and loaves miracle is a word from God to you this morning. And the message is this. If you come to me with the little bit you have, you will end with leftovers. If you come to me with the little bit you have, if we stick with Jesus, we will end with leftovers. He took seven loaves, or five loaves and two fish, fed 15,000 people and ended with leftovers. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you've never believed in Jesus. Maybe you're looking for him for the first time. And I just want you to know, I just invite you, believe in the one that God has sent. There is no other shepherd that can lead you to life and life abundantly. And if that's you this morning, I just want to invite you to head back to the prayer team. Because they are there to help you in that process. To give you the words you don't know how to say. Maybe you're in a different place and you're stuck. You're at mile five, maybe mile six, maybe mile seven. But your marriage is on the rocks. Your relationship with your kids is strained. Some temptation or behavior is out of control. And you don't know how you're going to keep going. My word to you this morning is this. Don't quit. This is when it counts. This is when it counts. You've been running part of your life on your own terms. And your invitation this morning is surrender and let Jesus teach you how to run the next few miles. Maybe for you this morning, the race is going really well. You've overcome a lot. You have a lot of scars. You have a lot of tools under your belt. And you're feeling good about where you're at. You have something to offer people here. I just want you to know that you have something to offer people here. And I want you to write that on your connection card. Because we need you so that people aren't running alone. As we close, my encouragement to you this morning, all of us, don't give up. This is when it counts. Continue to stick with the good shepherd. Believe in the one that God has sent. And know, know that if you stay with him, you will end up with leftovers. You will end up with leftovers. Let's pray. 
Father, forgive me for the ways in which I have done life on my own terms and expected you to bless that, expected you to conform to that. Lord, I surrender the way that I have been running my life and I need you and I ask you to change it. I'm done telling you what to do and I'm done asking you to bless it. Lord, show me what to do today. Show me where I need to believe in you. Father, change me from the inside out. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my plans to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.
I share a few announcements, um, let's just pray together, shall we? Let's just lift before the Lord the things in our hearts that we're carrying, the people that we're carrying, our cries in response to the sermon. Pray with me. Dear Father, we come to you receiving Jesus. We come to you needing wisdom and understanding. We come to you crying out for those that we love that are far from you. We cry out for our marriages. We cry out for our children, our spiritual children. We cry out for direction, Lord. Lead us in the path. Pour out the bread from heaven. We believe. Forgive our unbelief. Father, we just want you to send us out to love and serve you. In the name of your son, Jesus. I have a couple of announcements. First of all, in the lobby, we have these shirts for $5. We encourage you to buy one and wear it, to be reminded to love where you live. And it'll also help you to engage others in conversation about the Lord, about church. You can invite them to church. On October 11th and, nope, yes. 11th and 12th. I keep getting those dates wrong. On October 11th and 12th, we're having a membership meeting. This is for everyone, even if you have been here since the very, very beginning of the church plant. We are doing formal membership. We would like you to attend these meetings with us. Friday night, there will be a meal and there will be child care. Saturday morning, there will not be child care. Um, but let us know if you have a problem. We'll see what we can do to help you find some child care. So mark that on your calendar, grab a bulletin on the way out, it's, it's in the bulletin, and you can sign up in the lobby for that, or you can go to our church website and sign up there. Our website is lifechurchlivonia.org. As we send you out today to go and serve the Lord, can we just give thanks to the people that worship, Grace and Ben, the people in the back, Alex, for the word. Thank you so much. Have a great day.